Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be looking at a method to determine the line of best fit. And the method we'll be using to do that is called linear least squares. So more specifically, we're going to be looking at some data that is on the xy plane and trying to fit a line to that data. So I'm just going to draw some data here that fits to a line, but not perfectly, right? Now, generally, whenever we're trying to fit to a line, we write it out as something along the lines of y is equal to mx plus b. So this is the equation that we're trying to fit. And in order to fit that, we're trying to choose good values of m and b, since we know all the values of y and x from our data. Now, we have a ton of data points here. If we want to perfectly define a line, all we really need is two. But let's go ahead and take just a random sampling of our data points and use those to try to create a line. Our first data point, we're going to call y1. And that's going to be equal to m of x1 plus b. We have some x1, y1 that we are trying to fit into this line. So we can choose almost any value of m and b and make this work at this point. Once we get to our second data point, now there's only going to be exactly one value of m and b that should work. We have two equations and two unknowns, so there's no leeway. But we still have more data points. So once we hit y3, we start to be in trouble. Because now there's not going to be any value of m or b that actually make this equation work unless we just happen to get very lucky with our data. And of course, this just keeps on going. So I'm going to say that we have m data points. So our last equation will be ym is equal to this m for the slope multiplied by x sub m plus b. And these are all the equations that we're trying to fit. Now, this system of equations is overdefined. There are too many equations for the number of unknowns that we have. So in order to search for some clues as to what to do, we're going to rewrite this in matrix vector form. So I'm going to have an A matrix. I'm going to have a vector of the constants we're trying to find, right? This will be our m and b. And once we perform that multiplication, we should end up with a vector of y values. So this will be y1, y2, all the way down to ym. So our A matrix here will be the things multiplied by m in the first column and the things multiplied by b in the second column. Well, our x's are exactly what's multiplied by m. So we'll have an x1, an x2, all the way down to xm in our left-hand column. And then for the right-hand column, we just have b. Well, that's just b multiplied by 1. So these are all going to be 1s. So if we multiply this out, we should end up with exactly a vector of our equations. Now, if we were just to blindly go at this, uh, we would give these some names. And we could say that this is a times c is equal to y. And we would want to solve for c, which would say that we have a inverse uh, multiplied by y. The problem here is that a, a is non-invertible. So this can't work as we have it right now. And the reason that a is non-invertible is because it's not square. So in order to make all this work, we really need a square matrix where A is. So in order to kind of see where we might be able to get a square matrix out of the equations we have, let's just look at the size of the matrices we have right now. A is going to be M rows by two columns. And then C is two rows by one column. We need these numbers to match in order to do the multiplication. And then y is going to be m rows by one column. So what we really want here, instead of this m by 2, is going to be a 2 by 2 matrix. And we really want this to be a 2 by 1 as well. 
Now, the only th way that we can get to a two by two from this is to multiply by a two by m. So going through this multiplication, we would have the m's go away and we'd be left with a two by two. We're looking for a two by m matrix. And the only one we really have available is going to be a transpose. So if we transpose A, it just flips these values and we end up with a two by M matrix that we can plug in there. So looking at this, the equation that we'll end up with if we're pre-multiplying both sides by A transpose is A transpose A multiplied by C, which is gonna be equal to A transpose Y. So what we get from this is a two by two matrix here, which is invertible, multiplied by a two by one. And then whenever we perform this multiplication, we have our two by M multiplied by an M by one. So this is also gonna be a two by one vector. So now that this piece is invertible, it becomes very easy to go ahead and say that our C is going to be equal to a transpose A inverse multiplied by A transpose Y. And this is our solution for the linear least squares problem. Okay, now what if we don't just want any old line? If we don't want a straight line, we want a curve that we can fit. Because honestly, this Y equals MX plus B is not the best fit that we can make to this set of data that I've just randomly created. Really, what we want is a parabola. This looks much more parabolic than it does like a straight line. So if we wanted a line that looked something more like this, what would that equation be? How would we make that work? A parabola is defined pretty simply. We would just say that y is equal to some constant, we'll call it c1, multiplied by x squared, plus another constant c2 by x, and then finally we would need some c3 in order to get this parabola fully generalized. So now let's create some definitions. These are gonna be our constants. They're gonna be the things that go into our parameter vector. So we're solving for these, and we need a name, something to describe what's going on but with what we're multiplying. So we're going to give these some slightly different names. I'm gonna call x squared f1 of x. I'm gonna call x, f2 of x. And then finally, there's a one here that we're just pre-multiplying by. Well, that one is going to be f3 of x. So these three functions are what we call our basis functions. They are forming the basis of this approximation that we are creating. So that being said, how do we generalize our method here to fit a more general set of basis functions. Well, let's go back to what these equations actually look like. If we look at our first point, we would be saying that y1 is going to be equal to c1 times x1 squared plus c2 times x1 plus c3. And we would just continue that down all the way to y of m, which is going to be c1 x m squared plus c2 x m plus c3. Now, once again, we can write this as a matrix vector formula, and it looks pretty similar to what we have up here, but we just have a m by 3 instead of a m by 2. So our parameter vector here is just going to be all of our c's, c1, c2, c3, our A matrix is going to be x1 squared, x1 and one. Those multiplied by our parameter vector give us y1. And then we do the same thing for two, all the way down to ym. So once we have these basis functions, we would calculate the basis function for each of our data points, and then find this A matrix. And then we'd have a m by three matrix, which we could still multiply by a transpose and get a three by three. So now instead of this two by two, we'd have a three by three multiplied by a three by one, our C matrix, and then a transpose Y would end up as a three by one. And so we could solve for C1, C2, C3, uh, still using this same formula. 
So now that we've stepped up to three separate parameters, let's go ahead and do the most general form. So we're going to say that our basis functions are going to be a sum of i is equal to 1 all the way to n. So we have a completely general number of basis functions. And the way that we write this is to say that ci multiplied by our basis function fi of x. Now writing this out, our A matrix gets a little bit more complicated. For our first row, all of our x's are going to be x1, but our basis function is changing. So this first row is going to be f1 of x1, f2 of x1, all the way over to fn, which is the total number of basis functions that we have, but that is still multiplied by x1. The next row is just f1 of x2. This first column is always going to be f1. Then f2 of x2, all the way over to fn of x2. And then we can go all the way down for this for f1 of xm, f2 of xm, and then finally fn of xm. So a is now an m by n matrix. Our c vector is going to be c1, c2, all the way down to cn. Our c matrix becomes an n by 1. And then our y vector, again, is going to be m by 1. All of this still works out. We just need to plug it into this equation right here, and we'll be good to go. Now, there is a rule on what these functions should be. The way we have this written, our function has to be purely a function of x. We can't have any c1s inside the function here. So things like e to the c1x are out of the question. We have to have c1e to the x, or c1e to the 2x, or something along those lines. We'll get to some more complicated functions whenever we get to nonlinear least squares. But in order to keep this linear, we need to have our parameters pre-multiplying our functions, which are purely a function of x. Good luck and have fun programming this up.